All right. All right, I think we're about ready to get going here. So we'll go ahead and start. Here we go. Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Centennial Institute webinar with Michael Barone on American Politics 2020. My name is Jeff Hunt, and I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, where I help direct the university's think tank, the Centennial Institute. Tonight, we are co-hosting this event along with Colorado Mesa University. I wanna personally thank all the students from both Colorado Christian University and Colorado Mesa University for being a part of this evening. Now we always begin our evening with prayer and pledge. And today leading us in prayer and pledge from Colorado Christian University are two of our 1776 scholars, Lena Pachipachi and Sarah Morris. I'll turn it over to you to lead us in prayer and pledge. Wonderful, thank you. All right, please join me in pledge. Right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank, thank you. you, Lena. Sarah, prayer? Absolutely. All right, bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to first thank you for the opportunity to meet here today and to hear from Michael Barone. I pray specifically for our nation and leaders that you would continue to provide them with wisdom and truth. I ask, Lord, through your abounding grace that you would continue to sustain us in this time. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah and Lena, for uh, helping us out tonight. Well, friends, we're going to discuss Michael Barone's latest book, How America's Political Parties Change and How They Don't. The election of 2016 prompted journalists and political scientists to write obituaries for the Republican Party or prophecies of a new dominance. But it was all rather familiar. Whenever one or two great parties has a setback, we've heard this is the end of the Democrat Party or the Republican Party is going out of existence, yet both survive and thrive. Well, friends, I can't tell you, we, we couldn't have a better person to help navigate and guide us through this. Uh, he really is an almanac on American politics, Michael Barone. Michael Barone is an American conservative political analyst, historian, pundit, and journalist. He is best known for being the principal author of the Almanac of American Politics, a highly detailed reference work on Congress and state politics. It has been published biannually by the National Journal since 1972. And you can kind of see his expertise come through his latest book where he knows uh, so much about localities and uh, how campaigns play out in each one of these different localities. Uh, he really is a, a walking, breathing almanac. The almanac has been called the definitive and essential for anyone writing seriously about campaigns and Congress Mr. Barone is also a regular commentator on United States elections and political trends for the Fox News Channel. In April 2009, Barone joined the Washington Examiner, leaving his position of 18 years at US News and World Report. He is based at the American Enterprise Institute as a resident fellow. We are big fans of AEI at Colorado Christian University. He has written numerous books and essays on American political and demographic history. Friends, we're so glad to have him. Michael Barone, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for the kind introduction. Uh, when I accepted your invitation, I was looking forward to visiting Colorado, sharing the outbreak of spring on the Front Range and Western Slope, uh, to reconnecting with old friends and meeting new ones, and uh, to taking part in an institution uh, rejuvenated by Bill Armstrong, uh, citizen who be citizen politician who in his limited period term limited period in the united states congress made lasting contributions to public policy um i expected uh, that i would talk about president american politics in an election presidential election year and our continuing period of polarized partisan parity 
uh, in which demographic factor most highly correlated with voting behavior is cultural, moral, religious uh, beliefs by which people lead or try to lead their lives. Um, my initial expectations, as you can easily imagine, have been altered. Uh, COVID-19 coronavirus has changed many things, including my plans to travel uh, to Colorado, so I'm speaking to you electronically from a secure and unidentified location, um, far from the front range, uh, and through the miracle of uh, electronic communications, which may or may not be shared with the People's Republic of China regime. Um, the, uh, and the current crisis also expired, uh, inspired me to examine my, uh, to my talk to um, go beyond uh, the book that I've written most recently uh, to look at American politics in the past, present, and in the future. Um, for my politics of the past, I do want to share with you the main themes of uh, the book to which Jeff gave uh, reference, uh, how America's political parties change and how they stay the same. Um, in the politics of the present, I want to examine how the coronavirus is changing or not changing American politics in this presidential election year. And for politics of the future, for times when the current crisis is passed, I wanna suggest uh, what directions we should look to for leadership and progress um, as we have in the past. So let me start off with the past and with the fact that not very many Americans appreciate and that is the fact that we have the very old political parties in this country. We like to think of ourselves as a young country. Uh, in fact, we have the oldest and third oldest political parties in the world. Uh, the Democratic Party was founded in 1832 to reelect Andrew Jackson and deny recharter of the Second Bank of the United States. The Republican Party was founded in 1854 to repeal the Kansas-Nebraska Act and bar slavery in the territories. Both parties successfully achieved these policy goals rather quickly, within a dozen years. The uh, slavery, uh, the, the, the bank, Second Bank of the United States was not rechartered. The um, slavery no longer existed in the territories or indeed anywhere in the United States. Um, but those two parties are still here today still running against each other, still dominating American politics 188 years and 166 years after their foundings. Uh, by the way, I might add that the second oldest political party in the, in, in the world, um, at least by my reckoning, is the British Conservative Party, uh, founded as their historian Robert Blake. Lord Blake uh, suggests in his classic work in 1846, um, they have, their demise has been predicted on a number of occasions and they just came through with one of their uh, greatest vict electoral victories uh, in December, 2019. Um, in those 188 years and 166 years after their founding, uh, America has grown from a nation of 20 million to a nation of more than 320 million. Uh, and these parties have naturally adapted to emerging issues, to new constituencies, to innovative technologies, opinion shifts, original ideas, and new leaders. Uh, they've shifted positions on major issues. The Democrats started off as a free trade party. The Republicans started off uh, supporting the tariff uh, up through the early 1960s. Uh, then by the 1980s, they basically switched positions. The Republicans had become the free trade party, the Democrats, the protectionists. Uh, now with Donald Trump, it may seems to be turning the other way around. Uh, similarly, 19th century Democrats were the limited government party, respecting state autonomy. They were happy to tolerate slavery and then segregation in the South and the saloon in the North. Uh, let the locals have their way. Uh, the Republicans were more for federal government activism as witnessed by the, uh, uh, their role in, in the Civil War, of course, um, as backing in their role in backing various reforms and backing uh, gold standard of currency. And by their big spending habits, the Republicans uh, sponsored the first billion dollar budget 
1888 and 1890, and they got whomped in the next election, congressional election, as a matter of fact. Um, now we don't think of the Republicans as the big spending party, or perhaps it's better to say we don't think of them as the bigger spending party, uh, but that uh, is contrary to how they started off uh, more than nearly 200 years ago. But what has endured? and it's the central argument in how America's political parties have changed, uh, is the basic character, the personality, the DNA of each of these parties. The Republican Party has always been concentrated around a core constituency of people seen as typical Americans by themselves and by others, even though by themselves, they are never a majority of Americans. Uh, the composition of this core constituency has changed over time. Uh, the Yankee uh, Northern Protestants in the 19th century uh, were the core group of the Republican parties. They started off with the descendants of the uh, New England Yankees that had gone across the Northern tier of states. Uh, today, white married Christians are the core of the Republican party. But the party's basic character being formed around that core uh, has remained. Uh, the Democratic Party has always been a coalition of outgroups, of different groups of people regarded by themselves and others as not, not typical Americans, but who, when united, can make up a majority of the country. Uh, Andrew Jackson's party was a party of Southern frontier whites and Roman Catholic immigrants in the big cities of the North. Um, that was uh, sometimes a winning combination. It worked better if you kept them separate uh, and apart. Um, it, the Democratic Party had a rule for 96 years that it required two thirds of a vote at its national convention to nominate presidential candidates. That in effect gave each of these minority groups a veto over the presidential candidate, but it also meant for some chaos um, it took the Democrats 103 ballots to nominate a president in Madison Square Garden in 1924. Uh, today's Democratic Party is a coalition whose most loyal members uh, include unusually religious Black Americans, tend to be more fervently religious uh, than the national average, and very secular gentry liberals. Um, they're, they're together um, on, uh, they, uh, they, they they, they're together on impeaching Donald Trump and inveighing against him, um, but they're split on proposals that some of their presidential candidates have made for getting rid of tax exemptions for churches that don't perform same-sex marriages. Um, that's popular with the secular liberals, um, black members, uh, black Americans who tend to be members of uh, tradition-minded churches don't like that idea at all. Um, the enduring character and personality DNA of these, each of these two parties helps explain, in my view, uh, their longevity and their resilience. Structural factors, of course, help explain why we, prevalence of two-party competition. The electoral college and presidential elections, the single member legislative district for congressional and state legislator elections tends to encourage uh, the, the competition to be just between two parties. But I think there's something more fundamental about the persistence of these parties. In a nation that's always been diverse, religiously, regionally, culturally, economically, ethnically, racially, um, these, one of these two parties, sometimes both of them, has provided, it tended to provide an attractive op option, a means of expression and choice for the larger majority of American citizens and voters. Um, their basic character uh, shaped to help achieve specific issue goals in 1832 and 1854, long before the lifetimes of anyone now living, has continued to serve that function long since. Um, and I may mention that in that connection, when I say that the nation has always been diverse, that goes back to the British seaboard North American colonies in the 17th and 18th century. You had colonies that were 
founded by Anglicans and by Calvinists who didn't want to have anything to do with the Anglican church. You had one colony founded by a Quaker proprietor and another colony followed uh, by a Catholic proprietor. Uh, you had different religious traditions. You had pacifist sects from Germany and the frontiers in the in pencil in the, the what is now the Pennsylvania Dutch country before the civil before the Revolutionary War. And one of the things that the founders considered when they were structuring a federal republic with states continuing to have sovereignty um, was that you wanted to leave a space for diversity. You wanted to uh, have, in a particular, religious diversity. The founders were aware that the uh, 17th century, uh, of the 17th century religious wars, this was a part of their heritage. They didn't want to have that kind of struggle again. So they said in the, uh, in the Constitution uh, that there would be no religious test for office. This was entirely different from the uh, structure of England uh, at that time. This was a, a breakaway uh, from the traditions that they were familiar with, which required that you had to be a, you had to be a member of the Church of England to be a member of the Parliament from England. Uh, they also required that we that there shall be Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion. What did, did that mean? or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They basically said, look, Congress is gonna stay out of the religion business. We're not gonna have a national um, established church. States could have established churches if they want to. In effect, um, the established church lasted until 1833 in Massachusetts. Nobody brought a Supreme Court case against it. Tax money went to it. Um, but they said, let each part of the country go its own way, let each citizen practice the religion what it wanted, because they recognized that it was a diverse country. A lot of the political dialogue today at universities suggests that America became diverse uh, quite recently, about 20 minutes ago. Um, the fact is that it has been diverse from the beginning and that the founders wanted to create a framework in which a diverse people could exercise their religious rights and their freedom of expression in a way uh, untrammeled by government uh, censorship or prohibition. Um, and the two parties uh, have been adapting themselves over that time to uh, a population that has always had uh, important character uh, divisions um, and diversity. Um, now, in, in, in recent years, uh, at least in my lifetime, which is longer than that of most of the people in my audience, it's often been predicted that the parties would decline importance. Um, and certainly it's true that as organizations, they seem less formidable than they did in the days when public jobs and private charities were assorted by party bosses. And the party uh, public jobs went to the party whose candidates had won the most recent elections. Um, to the victor go the spoils, as uh, William Marcy, one of Andrew Jackson's supporters said in the 1830s. Um, yet uh, by uh, some metrics, the parties have a stronger hold over the hearts and minds of Americans as they used to than they used to. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, years when I was uh, writing the first dozen editions of the Almanac of American Politics, uh, American voters were more often than not ticket splitters. Uh, the, uh, if you go back to the 1972 election, for example, you will find that uh, President Richard Nixon was reelected by a wide margin over the Democrat George McGovern half of the congressional districts that Nixon carried in the country voted for Democratic congressmen, even while they were voting to reelect the Republican president. Um, in those years, Republicans seemed to have a lock on the presidency. Um, they won four out of the five presidential elections between 1968 and 88. Democrats maintained majorities in the House of Representatives for 40 years, from 1954 to 1994. Um, voters would tell you proudly that they voted for the man, not the party. They wouldn't usually say not the woman. Uh, they, voted, 
they, they would not say they voted for the woman of the party, but, and they often did, they'd split their tickets. Uh, and this was often a function, this was in large part a function as I explained in how America's political parties change of residual loyalties to historic causes. Why did white Southerners vote Democratic for many years to the point that John F. Kennedy, the Catholic Northern liberal, his number two state and percentage of the vote in 1960 was Georgia. Well, the reason was that Sherman had marched his troops through Georgia only 96 years before. Uh, and the voters there, time when black voters were not voting, uh, allowed to vote in most of Georgia, um, still were angry about that 96 years later. That helps to explain why um, the, you had the conservative parts of the Democratic Party, liberals and the Republicans. It was the vestigial uh, impact of things past, of, of, uh, of politics of the uh, of long ago past that had a searing impact on people's eye, on people's loyalties and their beliefs. Uh, and also had a, an effect on local politicians pursuing political careers. Um, but let me, but I'm moving here, I think, from the politics of the past to the present. Um, and I begin by noting that for the past three decades, as I wrote in How America's Political Parties Change, fewer and fewer Americans have been splitting tickets. You still find a fairly large number of voters who tell pollsters that they're independents. You hear some political scientists say, well, we have more independents than ever before. Yeah, but if you ask those, if you actually go and see how these independents vote, you'll find that some of them vote in most of them vote either up and down the ballot for all the Democrats or for all the Republicans in election after election. Uh, they're pretty loyal to parties. We've had uh, a record, you know, 2012, we had a record low number of congressional districts who voted for a president of one party and a member of the House of Representatives, this other party. It was the opposite of what we saw in 1972 when half of Nixon's districts voted for the other party's member as co congressman. So uh, we've had this close, and we've been living in a period of what I call polarized partisan parity of considerable uh, political static things of steady partisan patterns uh, for more than quarter century uh, with relatively little changes. Uh, since the first half of the 1990s, um, voters have been about equally divided between the Democrats and the Republicans. And whereas before 1990, the conventional wisdom was that the Republicans almost always won presidential elections and the Democrats won the House of Representatives forever. Uh, in fact, um, they, that has been turned upside down. Um, the closeness of the party uh, divide is shown by the fact Democrats have won four out of seven presidential elections starting in 1992. Repub but Republicans have won majorities of the House of Representatives in 10 of the 13 congressional elections starting in 1994. Landslide re-elections, like what we saw in 1956, 64, 72, 84, both parties won in those years, have become a thing of the past. And in fact, I think the reason for this predominantly is that the Politics, the political partisan preference has become highly correlated with issues of what I call cultural issues, issues that are related to or closely intertwined with views of personal morality and religious belief, things by which people are trying to live uh, their lives. Uh, so within each sectarian group, you find that uh, uh, the those who tend to be more secular or non-belief, uh, religiously skeptical, tend to vote for Democrats. And those who tend to be more religiously observant or devout uh, tend to vote for Republicans. And this is true. Um, it's true of mainline Protestants uh, and then evangelical Protestants tend to be more um, but Republican. Uh, among Jews, you see Orthodox Jews have been voting increasingly Republican, while Reform and Conservative Jews vote heavily Democratic. Um, and so this 
uh, pattern has continued. And the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and the election of the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives in 2018 are not exceptions to the rule. Uh, those were again, close contests, no landslides uh, these days. Trump actually lost the popular vote as everyone knows, um, uh, and, but won a significant majority in the House of Representatives. He was somewhat, ran somewhat stronger among non-college whites than previous Republican nominees. Um, Hillary Clinton was slightly stronger among white college graduates than previous Democrats. But these are relatively marginal changes. If you look at this over the long uh, haul of history, um, what you see is that the, these changes have not been as, uh, as, as great as we have typically had. And to uh, persist over a period that is now approaching 30 years uh, to have similar patterns uh, is unusual. Um, you know, we, we are accustomed now to elections where we only have uh, presidential elections where there only seem to be about eight or 10 target states. So we got 40 or 42 states that every person on the street can predict the result of pretty clearly. Um, it's easy to predict how 40 states will vote. It's hard to predict because the two parties are closely uh, divided uh, which party will win the presidency. As the coronavirus, COVID-19, and the sudden lockdown of the economy, the skyrocketing increase in unemployment, the disappearance, in many cases perhaps permanently, of millions of jobs, have they changed this political balance? So far, such polling as we've had over the last month, limited period, of course, uh, but one that everybody is aware of, that, uh, of major changes, suggests that the basic patterns uh, have remained in place. Donald Trump's job approval has risen slightly, it's still, but it's still perceptibly below 50% and has not changed very much. And in fact, over his whole presidency, there's really been less change in attitudes towards Donald Trump than we've seen to most other presidents. If you go back and look at you know, Ronald Reagan, for example, um, his first two years, his job rating plummeted. The country went into a recession. He was down at 30% approval. Uh, and then as the country recovered, and as America had successes in the world, his job approval went way up and he was reelected with 59% of the vote. Uh, we, don't, we haven't seen anything uh, like changes of those magnitudes in the case of Donald Trump. He has been staying pretty much uh, where he has been in a, with the public and where he was, if you go back and look at the polling during the 2016 campaign uh, in which he tended to trail Hillary Clinton. And in fact, as you know, lost the uh, popular vote plurality uh, to her. She won 48% of the popular vote. He won 46%. Uh, but we won 300 states with 306 electoral votes, uh, which was 100 electoral votes more than Mitt Romney, the Republican nominee in the previous election. Primarily because in states like um, Florida, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, second congressional district of Maine, White non-college voters voted significantly more for Donald Trump than they had for Mitt Romney, and that made the difference that enabled him uh, to become the president of the United States. Um, it's <clears throat> so this period, I don't see signs yet that this has changed, uh, and I see some signs that uh, it uh, it continues uh, when you see. Uh, responses uh, to questions about um, is hydroxychloroquine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a useful drug for some people suffering from the coronavirus COVID-19. Well, Donald Trump suggested in a press conference that it might be. If you go testing voters in America now, what you'll find is that Republicans think it might be very successful and Democrats think that this is uh, snake oil medicine uh, and don't believe it at all. 
Uh, it's uh, as if people had no independent source of information to make a judgment on this, except that uh, if it's Trump, it's either good if you're a Republican or bad if you're a Democrat. Uh, and uh, we have seen, you know, we've seen similar um, sorts of things. Uh, Trump do has done somewhat better uh, ratings on handling the coronavirus crisis, uh, but it has been limited uh, in that respect. Um, but let me pull back from projecting the forthcoming presidential election. I, people ask me, uh, you know, is Donald Trump going to win the election? And my answer is a very clear maybe yes and maybe no. Um, and, and, and look at uh, some of the consequences, the persistence of this polarized partisan parity over what has now been really a generation. Uh, we've had uh, three consecutive presidents winning re-election, serving eight years. It's only the second time this has happened in the history of our republic. Um, in that earlier period, it was the period of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe from 1801 to 1825. That was actually before uh, this institution was created, uh, before Colorado was admitted to the Union, and before the lifetime of uh, most people now living, although I should add one, one interesting fact that uh, people don't know. Our 10th president, John Tyler, a man who was born in 1790, um, has um, two of his grandsons are still alive. One, of, They own his house in Virginia, his plantation house. So we're connected to some extent by a man born in the first full year of George Washington's presidency. But that earlier period, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe was dominated by one president, three, uh, one party, three presidents who were all of the same party, easy, each one easily reelected. Um, and in fact, so much so that Monroe was reelected without opposition. One vote was cast against him in the Electoral College. Um, this period, we've had three presidents serving eight years each, but they've been, um, each of them seemed uncertain of winning a second term. If you go back to Bill Clinton in 1995, George W. Bush in 2003, uh, Barack Obama in 2011. Uh, and the, each president won with just 49-51 of 51% of the popular vote. Um, one interesting thing about these presidents and about the current incumbent, uh, whom none of the others supported in this 2016 election, is that they're all products of what's universally called the baby boom generation. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump were all born in 1946, count the first full calendar year after World War II, the only year in American history to have given birth to three presidents. Uh, and Barack Obama was born in 1961. Um, all three were born within the years generally given as, denied, as, as defining the baby boom generation. Uh, and if one adopts the definition in the William Strauss and Neil House pioneering book, Generations, which some people thought was kind of a gimmicky book uh, 20 some years ago, but in fact has stood up quite well. Uh, the birth years for the baby boom generation were 1943 to 1962. So it would take in all four of those presidents. It would include Newt Gingrich and John Kerry born in 1943 and would almost bring in Joe Biden born in December, 1942. Um, so, uh, these presidents were all part of a generation that was hailed just as its first members were reaching adulthood in the late 1960s as the most smart, most talented, wisest generation in American history. Um, it, the baby boomers have been full of, uh, have been gotten very much praise, including much of it from themselves, uh, and started writing popular songs about nostalgia for their youth when they were 23 years old. Um, the, uh, I like to say actually when I'm in a bad mood about the baby boom generation is that the good news is that the baby boom generation is going to die out. Uh, the bad news is that I'm going to die about the same time. Um, that's kind of bizarre, uh, kind of a nasty thing to say while we're in a crisis, but, uh, but here we are. Um, 
the the baby this baby boom presidents grew up in an America that had defeated fascism in a world war, come to power and they came to power you know, federal government inheriting a nation that had defeated communism in the Cold War. They took over the presidency as it appeared. Uh, it was the thesis, although it's often exaggerated, of Francis Fukuyama's end of hit the end of history. There was no longer any intellectually serious competitor to democratic capitalism. Other types of regimes might continue to exist, but their claims of being more uh, desirable and effective than American, European, and East and South Asian democratic capitalism were not capable of being taken seriously by any free and sentient people. Uh, the possibilities for American leadership towards an economically more bounteous, politically more free world seemed unlimited. Uh, we were living back in the 1990s, the turn of the 21st century, the second millennium, we were living in those broad sunlit uplands that Winston Churchill gave the world a glimpse of at one of his early speeches, in, a, in one of his speeches at an early turning point in the Second World War. Well, how's that worked out? Uh, I can make the argument that in historic perspective, these last decades have turned out pretty well. Economic growth and technological innovation have continued, even at paces that some consider lagging. Um, democratic governance and human rights have receded in some important corners of the world, but are far from disappearing. Um, and uh, they're, uh, they, 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 we are not in a world like the 1920s and 30s, the interwar period when one democracy after another succumbed to dictatorship and when totalitarian governance, whether in fascist or communist guys, seem to be as Anne Morrow Lindbergh wrote, the wave of the future. But all that said, many still will ask, uh, hey, how has that worked out for you? Or in the phrase that uh, some percolated up recently by which today's young people dismiss members of uh, the uh, a generation which once demanded that people never trust anyone over 30. Okay, Boomer, uh, for the past three decades have given us uh, Americans and citizens of other countries as well, uh, two profound shocks, two near catastrophic crises, two disasters which almost no leader or expert anticipated. One was the financial crisis of 2008, nine. The other is the COVID pandemic of 2020 which may perhaps extend beyond into 2021 or 2022. And I'm inspired to kind of bracket these two cases together by uh, thinking about what's been happening over the last six weeks, um, and uh, which was not something I anticipated when this invitation was extended to me to deliver this lecture some months ago. In both cases, the unanticipated crisis was the proximate result of public policies embraced by both political parties, supported by credentialed and experienced experts, uh, and by most articulate bodies of opinion. They were the product of consensus, bipartisan policies, good faith agreement, the sort of stuff that we are told by many commentators is what we should cultivate and want is all good things. Um, but they led in each case to significant disaster uh, in a crisis which there weren't any pre pre uh, precedents and which lacked some, anything like a clear cut convenient solution. Um, the policy behind the financial collapse was uh, encouraging home ownership by reducing requirements for obtaining mortgages, especially for Hispanics and Blacks. Uh, banks. Uh, issue, you know, you don't, you, you know, you don't, you didn't need any down payment, you didn't need any loans, you got extra points for giving uh, uh, mortgages to, um, to, to members of minority groups, and the banks sold off these dubious mortgages to financial firms who bundled them into mortgage backed securities, sold them all over the world. All this was based on the assumption that housing prices would always rise. And that proved to be wrong. And we had a financial collapse in which the world's financial systems were suddenly in free fall. 
the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, can be seen as resulting from a policy United, led, followed by the United States and politicians of both parties and leading Western nations as well, which was opening up China, interlacing our economy with China, integrating China into a keystone position of the world economy. So policy had its origins in Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon's opening to China 50 years ago, when China had no functioning modern economy. Um, vastly advanced after the United States granted China normal trade relations in 2000, supported by the incumbent President Bill Clinton and by the newly elected President George W. Bush, by both houses of Congress, by business and financial leaders, by both editorial pages, and so forth. Um, the hope was that China would embrace free markets and and the rule of law and ultimately some form of democracy and human rights. Um, but it's become apparent that Chinese Communist Party has no intention of doing any such thing. Uh, and when the virus began spreading in Wuhan, they blatantly denied its spread and virulence, muscled their allies at the World Health Organization to echo their denials. And so the disease has spread uh, all over the world. Um, it's, it's perhaps not coincidental that Donald Trump's candidacy for the Republican nomination for the presidency fared so much better with the voters that was predicted by professional pro prognosticators, including me. Uh, for uh, Trump campaigned as one repudiating conventional wisdoms, bipartisan policies. He opposed the opening to China, uh, said it cost America manufacturing jobs. Um, he opposed uh, the immigration policy, which welcomed low-skill immigrants, especially but not exclusively from Mexico, and opposed effective means of blocking and expelling illegals. Um, this was policy supported by presidents of both parties for a long period of time. He opposed the Iraq War, which was supported by the Bush administration by a majority of Democratic senators, including future presidential nominees, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden. Um, in, both part, in both crises, we've had, uh, in, you know, it, we've had in place some of the world's greatest experts on their subjects. Uh, ben Bernanke, the, great, the premier economic historian of the Depression of 1929, 33, as chairman of the Federal Reserve, we've now got Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, veteran of 35 years as the head of, of, of infectious diseases. Uh, these are people who have great expertise, and yet um, they're operating with a shortage of information uh, in a cloud of uncertainty in rapidly changing developments in which the familiar models are fairly um, fairly uh, are impossible to, are, are proving to be wrong time after time. Uh, as one writer wrote in the Wall Street Journal, decisions must be made before basic facts such as a disease's rate of transmission or what proportion of the infected develop symptoms are understood. <coughs> so, <coughs> The, if so, as I explained, in this era of polarized partisan parity, right now we are seeing Americans uh, have sharply different views on uh, what's, uh, what should be done and how our leaders are proceeding, views which tend to correlate highly, um, almost bizarrely, with their political voting preference. Um, we had, you know, we, we had uh, the Tea Party uh, rebellion again. 2009 and 10 against the policies of the Obama Democrats to following the financial crisis. Um, we are seeing objections to Donald Trump's policies on the part of, um, from part of some people who are demonstrating to get rid of the restrictions on movement. Uh, and others were seeing uh, attacks on him by the governor of Michigan, my old home state, who made the point that we should not um, have. Uh, you can't you can't go buying gardening uh, seeds and things because somehow gardening is uh, is a dangerous activity. Uh, it, it, I, 
I fail to understand the rationale behind that policy. And I gather very many people in the state of Michigan feel the same way. Um, you, you, you know, most of us would have thought having seeds is, a, you know, digging up dirt in your garden is a, is a, uh, is a pretty benign activity. Uh, the, and let me move now. Uh, I've been talking about the politics of the present to just a little comments on the politics of the future. Um, the, um, the, the, the complaints about uh, harshness of the complaints, you know, read Twitter feeds of, uh, about public policy now, a dozen years ago in the financial area, um, owes something to our harshly polarized partisan politics, also uh, to a standard set by leaders of the past. We have come to expect a lot of our leaders. And we look back to the performance of George Washington in the Revolutionary War in the early Republic, performance of Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, Franklin D. Roosevelt, World War II. Um, they convey the message that America has been blessed with transcendent leadership when it was really needed. And I think this impression was fortified <laughs> in the latter two cases <clears throat> by the way that photography, new in Lincoln's time, widely disseminated Roosevelt's, showed these two leaders challenged by the horrors of, uh, of, of warfare with huge casualties and great things at stake, showed how these leaders visibly aged during the war, how their faces grew more locked lined in their bodies more gaunt as the casualties mounted, and then they die suddenly just, at the, just around the moment of victory. They seem to be martyrs to the American cause, expending enormous talents to the utmost and giving their life for national success. Um, it, this view is consistent with a providential view of American history. Um, that, uh, and I call it almost a Rushmoreian view of American history, a view that America owes so much of its great success to great presidents, uh, the, of the intellect and character of those portrayed on Mount Rushmore, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, that is Theodore Roosevelt. It's interesting that work on the Rushmore sculpture was actually ended in 1942. It's never been completed because of the demands of World War II. And I think as a member of the baby boom generation, one of the things that was most shattering uh, about the, to this generation with the death of assassination of John F. Kennedy was that this seemed to go against the grain. This was not a president challenged by a war of the magnitude of the Civil War, World War II. It was not a president who dropped suddenly was taken from us at the moment of victory. It led people to wonder whether we were as providentially blessed as we had hoped that we would be. Um, I think it's fair to say that none of our uh, baby boom presidents uh, last four years have been Rushmorean figures um, and uh, that not very many people would really make solid claims that they have been. Um, and I think if you go back and look at the history of uh, Washington, of Lincoln, of Roosevelt, um, you find that they weren't perfect either. They made their mistakes and, uh, you know, prosecuted, you know, prosecu it, took, it took Lincoln some time to come find Grant and Sherman, uh, the generals that basically won the, uh, the prosecuted a victory. Uh, it took Roosevelt, uh, spent a lot of time on peripheral activities in North Africa and Italy, which uh, did not really uh, produce the war winning uh, things that we, uh, strategy that we needed. Um, but it's um, the, the uh, but I would say one of the things that we're, we're thinking about American history is that we, we're not just a country that's led by presidents. We're a country which is propelled forward by the people. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I would say, you know, the Rushmorean view, the waiting for another Rushmore figure, um, it should be supplemented at least by what I call the Tocquevillian view. Um, I've talked about the 
or the string of three consecutive presidents in the early 19th century. It was only five years after the last of them retired that Alexis de Tocqueville, young French aristocrat, came to America um, and, uh, and actually had interviews with their, their two successors, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, um, that informed his two volume classic, Democracy in America, um, in which uh, uh, Harvey Mansfield of Harvard is called the best work on, the best book on democracy and the best book on America. Uh, for to Tocqueville, the genius of America was not so much its great leaders and their national leadership, but the capacity of so many ordinary citizens to form voluntary associations and solve their own local problems and advance their own moral missions for the nation and the world. Um, none of the presidents who followed Tocqueville, who followed those whom Tocqueville met won a second term, and even their successes led to the irrepressible territorial expansion to the irrepressible conflict of the Civil War over the issue of slavery in the territories. Yet the 24 years they served also showed so the growth of major reform movements, the abolition of slavery, prohibition of alcohol, equality for women, uh, new religions like the, 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 the seeds of the uh, Mormon church, of the, seventh, of the Adventist church, um, and breathtaking technological progress, the railroads, the telegraphs, the surging industrial growth that gave the North the sinews of victory by which it won the Civil War. Um, similarly, periods of supposedly forgettable parents in the presidents in the five decades after the Civil War and in the 1920s saw enormous economic growth, the development of electricity, the conquest of disease, universal dissemination of the automobile and movies, uh, the woman liberating promotion of the refrigerator and the washing machine. Um, those of us who have been housebound have had more acquaintance with these devices perhaps than we're used to. And in fact, it, it, it has prompted at least some of us to think about what it would be like to live without them. The longtime Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan once said to me that World War II was won by J.P. Morgan, even though he died 1913, 30 years before that war, for he had channeled and brought forward British capital, investment in the United States, investment to finance the steel mills, the iron mines, the railroads, the auto plants, the shipyards that and aircraft and ultimately aircraft factories that produce more. Uh, during World War II, more war material than the rest of the world's nations combined. And it should be remembered as well that mobilizing that production was accomplished not by centralized command and control, by government bureaucracies and by nationalizing industries. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, had seen that enough of that in World War I and knew that it didn't work. Instead, Roosevelt insisted on bringing private, uh, uh, harnessing private firms, um, getting the people who run them to run the process of, of, uh, of production and ramping up production to levels that no one thought was possible, but which in fact won the war. And my lesson then, as I look to the future after surveying the past and present, is that much of American success and accomplishment even much that has contributed to Rushmorean leaders has also been the product of Tocqueville in America. As we watch the coronavirus crisis today, we see private firms providing the tests and the masks that the federal government but bureaucracies fail to provide. We see pharmaceutical companies, medical device producers race to test and produce vaccines and equipment. We see research laboratories financed by philanthropy as well as government competing and producing results that plotting rule bound government bureaucracies, which demanded that one copy of your applicant permission to, uh, uh, to produce a medical device be provided by paper and CD-ROM sent by US mail, um, it could not achieve. Uh, of course, it would be nice to have a Rushmorean president once again. But we might not recognize him or her if we got one. Plenty of Americans uh, doubted the policies and probity of Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt during when they were leaders. 
but maybe we should spend less time moaning about the mistakes and miscalculations of our current leaders, which are inevitable in a crisis without pertinent precedent, and more time in appreciating the strengths and creativities of Tophelian America, which in times of crisis and in times of repose have done so much to make the United States what Lincoln rightly called the last best hope of Earth. Thank you very much. Mr. Barone, that is wonderful. And I think what's helpful is uh, with your work is to understand the breadth of the history that we inherit, uh, that we don't just wake up one day with two parties that just kind of are operating. Uh, there is a whole history that it, we uh, have built upon that places us where we are today. And I think that's very helpful with your work. And uh, that's why I really appreciated your book. Uh, Friends, I do want to open this up to questions. We have both a Zoom chat and a YouTube chat, and uh, feel free to put questions in there, and uh, we will uh, do our best to answer them. If you're a student, please identify as a student so we make sure we uh, get, get a chance to prioritize uh, your questions. So either on YouTube or on Zoom, fill that out in the chat feature. Let us know if you have any questions. I, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Mr. Barone, I wanna ask you a, a few questions about your book and then about the kind of state of where we are today. Uh, you did a really good job in your book going through the voting patterns and the principles and the priorities of Midwestern voters. Maybe talk a little bit about that. You talked specifically about three instances that shaped them, 1787, 1854, in 1937. Uh, my second question, piggyback on that, is can you uh, give us a little insight on Western voters? Uh, many of us are here in Colorado. We're a unique uh, voting demographic, uh, oftentimes limited government when it comes to taxes. We support the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. We continue to vote down tax increases over and over again. Yet on the same time, we tend to be socially libertarian. Uh, we uh, uh, we're one of the first states to legalize recreational marijuana. The city of Denver decriminalized uh, psychedelic mushrooms. We have doctor assisted suicide in Colorado. So we have an interesting dynamic that goes on there. Uh, talk maybe a little bit about Midwestern voters and Western voters. Well, Midwestern voters, I, uh, you know, Midwest obviously played a significant role uh, in uh, Donald Trump winning an election four years after Mitt Romney lost an election. I, mentioned the role of state, you know, the flux. You, you have uh, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Midwestern, major Midwestern states changing uh, their votes from 2012 to 2016. You also have Pennsylvania, which particularly the Western part of it has many resemblances to the Midwest doing it. And Florida, which is full of ex-Midwesterners among others, um, producing that big result. And why did that occur? Um, the three dates are aligned. Why would people who supported, uh, particularly white non-college voters outside the major metropolitan areas, the million plus metro areas, which form about half our population, and about half the population in the Midwest, that's where the big switches were. Um, what got them going? Well, you had different traditions there that had inclined people to support Barack Obama more than they supported other Democrats. And I think in part because he was about to become or did be, and did become our first black president. 1787 was the Northwest Ordinance. It was, it was passed by the Continental Congress even while the Constitutional Convention was assembling in Philadelphia. Um, it provided that there would be no slavery in the land that is now Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. That was terrifically important because you had a lot of people from slave states moving into the, would move into those areas. If they had been, had slavery there, would you have had an Abraham Lincoln uh, having the career that he had in Illinois? I don't think so. Um, 1854 is the founding of the Republican Party. 1937 is the, years of the sit-down strikes, the formation of the industrial unions, both the Republican Party and the industrial unions, which dominated the Democratic Party, 
uh, were uh, had their main focus of their beginnings and their strength in the Midwest. And both of these institutions were more favorable to the rights of Black Americans than were uh, in established traditions in the Republican Party, going back to its pre-Civil War years, and in the Democratic Party, where the leaders of the industrial unions uh, really extended themselves more than the uh, institutional requirements uh, to support equal rights for Black people. And I think those things contributed to a abnormally high vote for uh, Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 in the Midwest and in the outstate Midwest beyond those metro areas, and then a lower vote. Once, uh, you know, they did not go for Hillary Clinton for a variety of reasons, uh, but she was not going to inherit his support. So I, I think that was part of the story of the Midwest. The West is a little different. Um, if you go back historically, uh, what does the West look like in the much of the 19th uh, century? We, we, you know, we only obtained this territory in the United States uh, basically in 1845 to 53. Um, it looks like a bunch of mining camps. Uh, you're looking at, uh, at areas, uh, you know, and you still have those towns in Colorado um, that, uh, that were uh, sort of separate and uh, you, it's the most volatile part of the country. It's not, it doesn't have very many people in it. Um, if you look at uh, America, the America that went to war in World War II, um, 80% of Americans lived uh, east of the, uh, of the front range of the Rockies. They lived east of Denver, east of Colorado. Um, if you watch television commercials advertising for products in the 1950s, as I did, they would say, prices higher on the West Coast. Uh, it was a, kind of a land apart. Um, Colorado, uh, had that heritage of uh, the mining camp heritage, which is still, um, you know, a, a historic heritage. It also had in Denver what was sort of the chief urban center of the Rocky Mountain areas of mercantile culture, of federal government agency headquarters, of a certain amount of solidity um, on that uh, golden step up the state capitol. And um, the, uh, it, you know, it was, a, it was a state closely balanced between the two parties for many years, and I think still is, even though it's a state with a relatively high degree of co white college grads, uh, it has been trending towards the Democratic Party in, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, it's still a fairly close and competitive um, state. At the, elected a Republican senator in 2014. So um, it's uh, the West, uh, what we've seen in, in recent years is that the, some of the West has moved, uh, the West Coast in particular has moved left. Uh, California uh, was the, in 2016, was the second most democratic state in percentage of the vote for Hillary Clinton in the country. We have never had before in our history of our country a situation where the largest population state has been at one end of the partisan political spectrum. Usually they have been voted within three to 5% of the national average for the two parties. This was a big difference. It's why Hillary Clinton won the plurality of the popular vote that take away California and Donald Trump wins a plurality of the popular vote, the other 49 states and DC. Um, and we basically on the West Coast, you've had a series of uh, economic developments. Um, you, you've had in rush of, you know, California for many years was a pivotal state when it had influx of Midwesterners in World War II and the three decades thereafter. Then it had an influx of Mexicans, low-income Mexicans in Southern California and immigrants from other parts of Central America, but tending to be low skill. And that has worked for the benefit of the Democratic Party there. You've had an exodus of people. The defense industries largely leave the West Coast. They were very important there. They brought a lot of people there in World War II. Um, people came to California and said, uh, hey, 
um, you know, this is actually America out there and it's got good weather all the time. Let's stick around this place and see if we can start a little business or something and, uh, and, and live out here uh, rather than go back and shovel snow um, and, and so forth. It's, uh, those it, it, housing prices as a result of environmental conditions have been hugely increasing and basically priced out the white middle class. They've been driven out of the West Coast. Uh, of California, the Willamette Valley in, in Oregon, uh, Puget Sound in, in uh, Washington State. Um, and so you, you've, the, the, that core group of the Republican Party, white married Christians are now heavily outnumbered in those West Coast states and at some risk of being outnumbered in, in, uh, in Colorado, uh, perhaps even in Arizona where, um, much of the incoming mig in migration has been white college graduates who have been trending somewhat towards uh, towards the um, towards the Democratic Party, and of course, there's the one other factor in Colorado, and I don't know if this is necessarily partisan. You're the least obese state in the country. <laughs> you people are fit. That's because you've got a state where most people are living 5,000 feet or more above sea level, and you got to expend a little bit of energy just to walk uh, from the kitchen, from the from the television room to the kitchen to to pick up another bag of potato chips. <laughs> we are a very active state, absolutely. Uh, we're getting a few questions here about the electoral college in Colorado. We're facing a ballot initiative to turn back what was initially passed at the state legislature to join the National Popular Vote Compact. Uh, what do you see as the future of the Electoral College? Uh, can it withstand these efforts to uh, change it now? Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that the Electoral College can stand the, uh, will remain. Um, the uh, efforts to defeat it now are based largely on Democratic Party being unhappy that uh, in 2000 and by a bigger margin in 2016, the plurality of voters favored their, nationally favored their political, their presidential nominees, but they lost the uh, majority in the electoral college. Um, my own advice as a former political consultant is that uh, it's easier, it's harder to change the constitution than it is to actually change your party's stand on a few issues and its rhetorical um, posture. Um, and uh, try to win uh, under the current system, which of course the Democratic Party came very close to winning in 2016. Uh, you know, 70,000 votes changed and they would have uh, won the election. Um, the, uh, you know, it, uh, as far as the compact is concerned where the state pledges to vote for the uh, popular vote winner, all I have to say is that when the, Repu when the Republican Party wins the popular vote, uh, but loses the Electoral College, I think that the, all these same folks that have been back this compact will suddenly find principled reasons why they don't back it anymore. Uh, and uh, I've observed uh, over the years that one of my laws of politics uh, is that uh, people who uh, pro bring forward process arguments, I want to really have the popular vote. I don't care that it's just my side that's hurt by this. I think it's a fairer process. All process arguments are insincere, including this one. Um, they're they're out after they're result oriented, and not process oriented. And uh, I think that uh, it's gonna it's gonna fail um, uh, of its achieved purpose, or simply be. Um, you know, uh, of no help if the, you know, Barack Obama did not need the National Voting Compact in order to win uh, the Electoral College. He won a majority, not just a plurality, but a majority of the popular vote and the Electoral College fell into place. And in fact, it was the, Re the Republicans who have been, you know, who have fared worse in the Electoral College in some sense in earlier elections. Barack Obama and George W. Bush both reelected with 200, with 51% of the vote. 
The difference is that Barack Obama got, I think, 332 electoral votes out of that 51%, and George W. Bush got only 286. Wow. Can we talk a little bit about uh, Joe Biden, the Democratic primary, gone through a very interesting primary process recently, uh, a lot of energy among Bernie Sanders supporters, and yet the Democrat base overall supports Joe Biden for the nomination uh, for the Democrat Party. Can we talk? Can you share a little bit about your insights on that process? What does Joe Biden represent within the Democrat Party that would allow him to get to that position as the as the winner of the primary? Uh, well, I think he uh, ended up, uh, you might say, the folk de mieux candidate. The, uh, for want of somebody better. Um, you know, the Democratic Party had something like, what, 24, 26 candidates for president at one time or other. You had two uh, office holders uh, in Colorado. Right. Uh, yeah, you know, governor who won two terms, a U.S. senator who's won two terms, uh, both, you know, intelligent and attractive figures, in my view, um, seeking the presidency. Um, you know, I don't know if, why Jared Polis didn't do it too, but hey, uh, you know, maybe next, you know, it, it, it was in part because uh, the flightiness of white college grads, uh, the Democratic Party increasingly has become a gentry liberal party, high income, high education level college grad, liberal college grads living in major metropolitan areas and, you know, shopping at, you know, trendy places and things like that. Um, they also tend to flutter around in their political preference. You saw them move towards uh, Elizabeth Warren and then move away. You saw them move towards Pete Buttigieg and move away. You saw them um, thinking about Amy Klobuchar, but not very much until uh, you know, when we got to New Hampshire, she sorted it all right, a state that's full of that kind of voter. Um, and um, they're not very solid. Um, I think that one of the things that is fascinating is the, the value to Democrats of um, having the imprimatur of support from Black voters. Black Americans cast something between 20 and 25% of the votes in Democratic primaries for president. Um, this, uh, you know, uh, so they're an important part of it, but there's also the feeling that um, you're not really a moral person if you don't get support from black voters. I think that's what sank Pete Buttigieg uh, who did quite well with the almost all white electorates of Iowa, which he may have won, and New Hampshire, where he ran strongly. Uh, but black voters clearly had a real block about uh, electing, uh, nominating, supporting, voting for a gay candidate. And uh, I think that just undercut him in moral worth. Uh, you had... Uh, uh, you know, you had Congressman Clyburn, a beloved figure in South Carolina, who was a sort of a civil rights relations uh, coordinator for a Democratic governor in the early 1970s, a state legislator for many years, when South Carolina got a black majority congressional district after the 1990 census. Uh, he was elected in that district, has been reelected ever since. Um, he seems to be a nice man who has a, when he came out for Biden, what, five days, six, six days before the primary, suddenly black voters who are majority Democratic primary voters in, uh, in, in South Carolina just came out for him and the support for the other candidates just vanished. Uh, a fascinating enterprise, but I think, uh, you know, I think Democratic voters, they insist that Donald Trump is a racist, although I have to find it very difficult to find racist statements in Donald Trump's repertoire of, uh, you know, the, the tweet of hers. Uh, and they, 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 they believe that they are morally justified because they're not racist and Republicans are. Um, but that also gives black voters a kind of veto over the Democratic nominee that's even greater in moral force than 
the simple numbers and the fact that black voters tend to be 20, 25%. And in past primaries have tended to vote more or less unanimously for one candidate and the other, or the other, um, which you know gives you powerful leverage in um, in in primaries. So that's my sort of sense of the Democratic uh, primary this year. And of course, then we suddenly discussion sort of ceases after uh, the coronavirus comes on, and we lose. You know, suddenly discussion ends. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to see how that plays into this election, which is part of my next question. Uh, I want to go back real quick to Joe Biden. Is there a sense that Joe Biden does well competing against Donald Trump uh, for non-college educated white voters in some of those critical states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan? Maybe he's the candidate that can appeal to them better than other members of the Democrat primary. But well, then, some people. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some people have thought so. I mean, there's certainly an argument. He talks about how he grew up from, you know, Irish Catholic family in Delaware. Really, wife's family was involved in politics in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Lackawanna County, uh, classic Democratic coal mine, anthracite coal mining county. Um, you know, he, 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 the current polling doesn't show him having any special. Uh, impact with uh, voters of that description that's uh, not more than just being not Trump. Um, you know, uh, we will see how that plays out. I think, you know, part of it is uh, how, how he does as a persona. And I think uh, there's also the question, you know, he's, he's uh, seven, 77 years old. Um, is he in shape to be president? And you know, I think that uh, there's a widespread view that he's, you know, that he's got he's got some cognitive decline. Um, of course, Donald Trump is 73 years old, and some people think that he's got cognitive decline too. Although I think the signs are less so. Um, but it's uh, it's a little bizarre. I guess we have to thank or blame Ronald Reagan for that. Um, mm -hmm. He ran for president, was first elected at age 69 and reelected at age 73. And before that, nobody ever thought a person that age could be elected and that age could be reelected. So he changed the equation uh, for president's uh, elections. And, uh, and here we are with the leading edge baby boomers, you know, uh, Donald Trump born in June, 1946, uh, following George W. Bush born in July 1946 and Bill Clinton born in August 1946, all within about nine months after victory over Japan. Wow. Now on the, uh, on the issues that we may face in this election, you've got everything from the impeachment trial to coronavirus, oil collapse today. Uh, there's a lot of time between now and the election. I've worked on two different presidential campaigns, one on a primary and one in a general. Uh, there's a lot of time for different things to happen, but what do you see as the major issues that are gonna be driving this upcoming election? Well, obviously the, you know, the role of the coronavirus and all this, but what seems fascinating to me so far, you know, ready to change my opinion when the numbers change, is how steady opinion has been on uh, for and against Donald Trump. Um, his numbers have been astonishingly steady. It, uh, you know, the old political science rules were if unemployment goes up slightly, your job rating goes up a fair, uh, down a fair lot, so forth. Uh, this doesn't seem to events don't seem to be playing as great a role uh, in assessments of Mr. Trump as we, as we are accustomed to seeing for presidents. Uh, I think that's a function of his particular character, his personality, which some people find exhilarating and some people find exasperating. I think it's also a feature of our polarized partisan parity where 
you know, it's not just during Donald Trump's presidency, but also during Barack Obama's, George W. Bush's, and to some extent, Bill Clinton's. When you ask voters how the economy was going, uh, the Dem if you had a Democratic president, the Democrats would say, hey, the economy is terrific. Republicans would say, oh, the economy is in the dumpster. It's terrible. Um, and, uh, you know, the results tell you more about uh, which party the person supports rather than uh, what condition the economy is in. Right. And, you know, you saw this, you know, and you get a certain amount of psych, you know, the Democratic candidates are going around saying, well, um, in the, most of the 2020 campaign, 2019, saying, well, you know, low income people are falling behind, the rich get richer. Well, actually, economic data uh, during the Trump presidency has been that uh, low income people have had greater percentage gains in their uh, wages, salaries, and incomes. Um, you know, that's, uh, you might argue that Mr. Trump had nothing to do with that. It's a result of exogenous factors, or you might say that that's totally his doing or something. Um, one way or the other, the Democratic candidates have just uh, not processed that fact and have continued with the dialogue which candidates of both parties indulged in. You know, low-income people are not doing so well. Well, actually, they are doing better. Hmm. One of the things you mentioned in your books that, I've, that I found interesting was the notion that the Democrat Party generally draws what you uh, call the ethnic outgroups. Uh, the issue of identity politics has become uh, a much talked about issue, but it sounds like from the beginning, uh, the Democrat Party has uh, prided itself on the, the idea that they are the welcoming party for the ethnic out uh, groups as opposed to, as you mentioned, the, uh, the Republican Party being a party that says we're the, we're the American Party or we're made up of the American parties, you, you say it uh, more eloquently than I can. But can you talk about the notion of how identity politics and ethnic outgroups plays into uh, the difference between the two parties? Well, Martin Van Buren in New York was uh, you know, the sort of the guy that did the engineering work on the founding the Democratic Party and creating the first Democratic National Convention, which proceeded to nominate him for vice president. Uh, Martin Van Buren would, uh, you know, get the uh, Irish immigrants coming into the docks in New York and uh, take them right to the voting polls and vote Democratic. Um, you know, you had... Uh, you know, there's a certain amount of the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And there's a certain amount of, when you got a multi-ethnic country and we were multi-ethnic colonies of the British going back to the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, when you got multi-ethnic group, you have competition for jobs. You have, uh, you know, just the kind of rivalries that teenage boys are on the running around the streets tend to have, uh, you know, the gangs of New York, that old time stuff. Um, this, is, uh, this is a part of, of life in, a, in what has always been a diverse society. So, um, you know, if the, uh, if the, the if, if, if Irish Catholics came over here and felt antagonism towards, uh, you know, English Protestants, they felt antagonism towards the kind of Americans who seemed to be the equivalent of English Protestants or the descendants of English Protestants or members of, uh, you know, uh, Protestant churches and so forth. So, um, and, you know, there were differences over public policy. If you go back to the 19th century, um, public schools in the United States tend to be pretty much um, sectarian Protestant schools. You know, they, they taught a sort of homogenized Protestantism um, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, um, Bishop Hughes in uh, New York set up a whole series of Catholic schools and uh, because he felt that that was not good education for kids to go to what he thought was a Protestant school. And you find Catholic uh, Democratic politicians up to and including Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the late 20th century, uh, lamenting the closure of Catholic schools because he liked to 
see uh, can that institution continue there as uh, an alternative to uh, what it becomes secular rather than Protestant public schools. Hmm. So what would you say today's uh, ethnic outgroups are that make up the Democrat party? Well, black Americans have been the, uh, you know, for since 1964, voting about 85, 90% democratic. Uh, there are signs that that percentage may be decreasing. There's a sign in particular that young black men are more supportive of Donald Trump. And if you're looking at older black women, they're very unsupportive of Donald Trump. You find difficulty finding somebody in that demographic characteristic that's voting for uh, Donald Trump or for Republicans these days. Um, you find, you know, uh, a lot of Democratic uh, analysts like talking about people of color uh, and suggesting that they're all sort of voting like Black Americans. That's really not true. Um, you know, the, the groups of people that we uh, analyze sometimes under the label of Hispanic are people that come from a variety of backgrounds, have gone to a variety of different places, inserted them, found themselves dealing with politics in um, with, where there are different issues in different states and different alignments, uh, and they're not, not at all uh, the same. So you've got, you know, in New York and New Jersey, uh, where, the, you know, Hispanic voters tend to come from backgrounds that are Puerto Ricans, uh, who migrated a long time ago, half a century ago, uh, Dominicans and others, they're voting very heavily Democratic. You go to Florida, and uh, not just the Cuban Americans, but a lot of other um, people under the label of Hispanics, including Puerto Ricans that have been uh, going to the resort areas in, in Central Florida, the I-4 corridor in large numbers in recent years, um, uh, Latins from other countries. And you find people like Senator Rick Scott, a uh, Republican, uh, and Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican, winning about 48% of the vote from Hispanics in Florida. Basically, there's no substantial that margin for the Democratic Party from Hispanics. They may be carrying a very small plurality in what were very close races, and which were two upset Democratic victories that many analysts did not expect. So um, that's those are differences that we see. Um, other you know, differences. Um, I don't know, if you look at the, look at votes for Donald Trump in the primaries, his best uh, ethnic groups, the Republican primaries in 2016, were Scots-Irish, Appalachians, descendants of the people that migrated primarily from uh, Northern Ireland, from Lowland Scotland, uh, some of the Northumbrian, North of England. Uh, in the period uh, 1763 to 1775. That included Andrew Jackson's parents. Uh, these fighting peoples along the Appalachians. Uh, um, and uh, they've, Walter Russell Mead has talked about their impulse in foreign affairs, which is basically they tend to be isolationists, don't care about other countries, anything else. If anybody attacks the United States, they want them destroyed. Uh, and that's the, you know, uh, that group and Italian Americans very heavily for Donald Trump. You go looking at the uh, Northeast uh, where you got a lot of Italian Americans in those neighborhoods uh, and in parts of Florida where you find Italian Americans come people, the, the, um, the strongest areas in the Florida primary for Donald Trump where you had, where you had migrants from New York, Metro New York. Italians, Irish, and other people. You have a few Jewish people from there, but most of the Jews from Northeast who migrate to Florida register in the Democratic Party and don't vote in the Republican primaries. So they were not a significant factor. And those other groups, primarily from different Catholic groups, uh, supported Donald Trump more than people who grew up in the, um, in the Old South. Hmm. Well, Michael, I know it's late where you are. I want to just tell you how much we appreciate your insight today. I want to encourage everyone, get a copy of How America's Political Parties Change and How They Don't. 
it is uh, like today, it's like having a steak dinner. You're going to go through a lot of uh, detail and, uh, and Michael can go so deep on these issues. It really is fantastic. Also, get a copy of the Almanac of American Politics so you can understand uh, how different counties uh, make up America and how we really all play a role in these elections. It, it is very important. Michael, I'll give you any last closing words before we wrap up. Well, thank you. It's been very, uh, very nice being with you. I'm honored to have been asked to give uh, this lecture and uh, I uh, hope I didn't trespass too much on listeners time, but I really have been inspired to do some um, reviewing my work on how America's political parties change again and trying to figure out where we're going next. Uh, so into another chapter. And so from my uh, secure and identified uh, location, uh, I want to thank you and best wishes uh, for you in the future. Well, thank you so much. And uh, God bless you, Michael. To all of you that have joined us today, I want to encourage you. We've got another great webinar coming up uh, April 30th, 10 a.m. Go to our YouTube channel. We'll be hearing from Johnny Moore of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom as we talk about their latest report that will be coming out from USERF uh, on uh, religious freedom around the world and the kind of current state of that. So that'll be Wednesday, uh, or sorry, I'm Thursday, April 30th at 10 a.m. Be a part of that. If you are looking for that next chapter of your life, this is a wonderful time to pursue that online degree with Colorado Christian University. You know, we have over 7,000 students that are part of the online program. 88% qualify for financial aid. So if you need help, we're here to help you. Over 80 programs to choose from. The average class size, only 11 people. So you're going to get that uh, personalized attention you're looking for. Now is the time to pursue that new opportunity that you've been looking for uh, with Colorado Christian University. Go to ccu.edu. I want to thank our friends at Colorado Mesa University for being a part of this evening with us. We look forward to future partnerships with you and to all of our students at CCU. Thank you for being with us. God bless you all. Have a good night.